people getting killed for various reasons. That's something that belongs in the movies or in a crime story, but now feels sometimes like I'm living in one. This is part five of What Happened to Annie, a new six-part series from Sky News Storycast. I'm Rona Dugo. Previously, in part four, no evidence has emerged to suggest there is anything linking Annie's death with CIA activity at Presswick Airport. However, the family and journalist Marcello Mago still believe Annie was murdered. The, 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 the major thing um, was the massive bruising and swelling to her temple, which made me think immediately that she had been hit very hard on the side of the head with a blunt instrument, baseball bat or similar. And so to part five of Annie's story, the case for suicide. Before it starts, a quick word of warning. This episode contains descriptions of death and images of Annie after death that her mother, Guya, has given us permission to reference. It's now August 2019, in the West End of Edinburgh. We're standing outside Murrayfield Stadium, near where Annie used to live at Linton Court Apartments. As you come out the front door, you turned left and you had about a thousand yard walk and you'd be at Murrayfield. The last time we were here, caretaker Derek Brown spoke enthusiastically about Annie's life in Edinburgh. She's a lovely girl, very outgoing, quite vivacious, and she was really trying to get a hold of English. And I think that's why she chatted such a lot. But she used to tell me about going to the rugby club as well. She, she'd become a rugby fanatic. She never mentioned depression or any of that type of thing. She's very bubbly. Of course, Annie was not only a girl with an interest in rugby, but a singer. It's been so long since I met you. And since we started making this series, Annie's family have given us another one of her songs, Saturday Night, recorded just months before she moved to Edinburgh. This image of a confident performer was just one side of Annie. Hiya, Bill. In 2005, Bill Fell was the president of Murrayfield Wanderers Rugby Club. He only met Annie once, in the summer of 2005, when the club had a Cayley, but she stood out. She actually turned up to one of these sessions, and because she turned up on her own, Mainly, these kind of events, people would come as a couple or as a group. Uh, if you've ever been to Cayley's, uh, you know it's people turn up mob-handed to want to do Highland dancing or Scottish country dancing. They come up with a squad. And because she was on her own, she sat on her own and I spoke to her briefly and she said, oh, I saw it advertised. Thought I'd come along to see how it was. And then she did come up to the bar and spoke to me and one of our barmaids. And of course then she turned up the following week when one of our buses was going away to a second 15 game just to go and support the team. So she showed she was keen on rugby. And really that's the only contact that we actually, or anybody in the club that I'm aware of had with her. Annie had different sides to her personality, like all of us. But when you consider she moved country on her own, well, it's not that unusual to hear about her socialising alone. However, Bill suggests that images like these were taken as proof that Annie was becoming withdrawn and that ultimately she would self-harm and die by suicide. I think it was actually the police who told me that she'd cut her hair off, or her hair had been cut off. Now, when I saw her, she had long hair. She may have cut her hair a month later, September time, whatever. But her mother was under the impression that it could have been just prior to her death. Or if she was under some kind of stress that she had decided where some people self-harm, 
cut hair off. There's some way of relieving stress, I don't know. I don't. And these are all the things that the police have. We know that when the police interviewed Annie's friends in Edinburgh, some of them said she'd been depressed. We've tried to reach out to these friends, but for reasons we can't explain, none have gotten back. For us, this was surprising, because they almost certainly have important information regarding Annie. Could it be possible that they too have been scared off by the CIA rumours that have come to surround Annie's death? Or was she indeed depressed enough to cut off her own hair, just like the police told her best friend Maria? She's told me when depressed people cut their hair off. And I said, well, I don't think Annie would ever cut her hair off. 14 years on, Maria believes the only thing that can solve the puzzle of her best friend Annie's death is her body. Her body will tell. That's my main focus and that's my that's what's what is driven me ahead. So nine months after we first met, we went back to our home office pathologist, Dr. Stuart Hamilton. Of course the hair was an issue. Um, and now, armed with both the Scottish and Swedish autopsy reports, he looked again at the case's most troubling questions, starting with Annie's missing hair. What we know from the autopsy report is that uh, plucked and cut hair were taken for examination. Which was brought to the attention of the police in Scotland by the London embalmer. We can also see in the Global Networks document that they have trimmed four to five centimetres of hair uh, when they were trying to assist with making Annie as presentable as possible. They note that the hair is falling out during washing and combing. That's not uncommon when somebody starts to decompose. The, the hair roots become weak and it will come out very easily. The London Embalming Company Global Funeral Network's assistants claimed Annie's body had not been properly stored after she died. This is something that would have increased the rate of decomposition, according to pathologist Dr Hamilton. If a body is in a fridge and kept cool, then decomposition will be slowed down. If it's left at too warm a temperature, it will be accelerated. So we've got all sorts of factors and forces and thoughts all crashing together here. Annie's mother, Guya, an undertaker goon, had always believed the missing hair and scratches on Annie's knees were brought about by some kind of struggle. There doesn't seem to be any particular evidence of bruising. Bruising would suggest that hair had been forcibly removed in life and you get a bit of bleeding from that. I think the most likely explanation is it is probably a mixture of deliberate recovery of hair for evidence and removal of hair during a cleaning process. But just like the decomposition, an alternative explanation for this scratching was to emerge on a return visit to Presswick Beach when we set out to understand how the authorities might have arrived at their conclusion of suicide. But how far they actually went, we don't know. But back to the beach, and the last time we were here, we missed something because it had been high tide. I mean, I was brought here before as, as this being the point by Maryborough Road. Uh... Stood here in August with the marine expert, Professor Stuart Cunningham, and above the wind and the waves, you can just about hear him making a connection between the rocks on the south end of the beach and injuries matching some of those suffered by Annie. I mean, it isn't really surprising that a body would be scraped up a bit. Professor Cunningham says he's not surprised to hear Annie's body had been scraped a bit. 
because the conditions on the weekend she died would almost certainly have brought her into contact with these rocks on the beach. Yeah, based on um, how, what I understand the prevailing conditions at the time of tide and wind and currents, I think the likelihood is the tides would probably have just moved her backwards and forwards within this vicinity. And when you add to that how a drowned body reacts in the sea, this explanation for the scratch marks on her knees sounds convincing. Though we should remind you that Annie's knees had not been exposed when she was found dressed in dark jeans. Pathologist Dr Hamilton. One of the things that, again, people who are used to dealing with bodies from the sea are aware of is that a body will float face down, so with the back on the surface and the limbs dangling. If you're in relatively shallow water, what's going to happen? Your knees, your knuckles are going to come into contact with the sand, the gravel, the stones at the bottom of the sea, so they will scrape across them. You will get a degree of injury in those areas. But if Annie had indeed entered the water wearing these jeans, a pair of white trainers and a red top, along with her jacket and bag, then how was it that the tide never scattered all these items down the beach, instead depositing them close together? Marine expert Stuart Cunningham. I mean, my expectation would be, because the wind was very light and we would see almost no effect, that items that are being moved around by the tide are unlikely to have dispersed very far apart. They could have stayed quite close together. You need other processes like eddying motions and so on to move things apart, and they take quite a long time to start separating objects. And having used tidal data to explain why Annie, along with her jacket and bag, ended up close together on the beach, we wondered if it could be used to solve the mystery of where Annie entered the water. Um, Annie's body was found. There's an area just down to the left beyond the boats there called the salt cottages. Something um, that Mar might potentially Mar bring into play right. new witnesses or new yeah. information. I think there's a whole number of unknowns because we don't actually know when Annie entered the water. So that means that we don't know if she was exposed to one ebb tide, one ebb tide, one flood tide. If she was exposed to only one of those, she might have been displaced several hundred metres, but not that far, not out of this general area, I would imagine. Now, this general area our marine expert Stuart Cunningham is referring to is actually the same area of beach where the witnesses, Andrew and Doug, saw the indistinct figure by the waterline. This would reinforce the position of the Crown Office that it was indeed Annie stood looking out to sea that Saturday in December. The two autopsy reports concluded that Annie drowned. But if she drowned by suicide here in Presswick Bay, how was it that no saltwater algae or diatoms were found in her bone marrow sample? Why the diatoms are not present in the analysis, it may be on the most extreme theory that she did drown in brackish water and was placed into the sea. A pathologist cannot exclude that. The other is that the analysis simply did not identify them. But why not just test the lung sample, because they do have a lung sample? Yeah. It may well be that, you know, diatom testing is expensive. And unfortunately, this is the world that we live in. The more specialists the work, the more it costs. And what about the DNA sample on Annie's hands? The one that somehow survived being in seawater long enough for Annie's skin to wrinkle, but not for her body to take on a bloated effect. Pathologist Dr Hamilton again. On the simplest reading of this, all that it tells the observer is that a female DNA has been deposited on Annie's hands. That could be shaking hands with somebody, it could be something more sinister. We don't know where exactly on Annie's hands this DNA was found, 
But if you remember, we only learned about this DNA sample after the Swedish police detective Hans Melander visited Scotland. It would later emerge that the police were unable to find a match. With respect to identification, you could only compare DNA to any database that you have. But if the person is not on a criminal database, then you have nothing to compare that sample to. You can draw conclusions about the DNA, but not then get a match with somebody who exists. And the police would only have been able to make a match if the DNA belonged to someone whose details they previously had on record. And most databases of DNA in this country and in Scotland are either people who have committed a crime or people who are on what's called the exclusion database, so people who have a good reason to potentially leave their DNA at a crime scene, for example, a police officer. It could also be the case that the DNA never washed off because it was never in the sea. It could well have belonged to someone tasked with recovering Annie's body. Very simply, that means if someone enters a crime scene, they will take something of that crime scene with them and they will leave something of themselves there. That can actually be extended now, particularly in the era of DNA, that if you interact with another person, you will leave something of yourself on them and they will leave something of themselves on you. All that that tells you is that those two people have interacted, not how they've interacted. For us, this attaches even greater significance to the hard evidence that was recovered, like the autopsy photos no one can access. So I, I do think that Annie was probably just a very unlucky victim of someone intending to rob her. But freelance journalist Marcello Mego says the photo shown to him by the family left him convinced Annie was brutally assaulted and murdered. Because of the blow to the head that I've got no doubt was struck. And in the case for suicide, this is the last thing we have to go on. So looking at the photograph, uh, it's an old photograph, it's not of the best quality. The family have given their consent for pathologist Dr Hamilton to review that image. What I can see is I can see some areas of discoloration to the face, particularly towards the right-hand side below the ear. From the point of view of the pathologist, this looks more like post-mortem change. It looks like changes of decomposition rather than true bruising that has occurred in life. From what I have seen and from what I have read, these marks are not described at the first post-mortem examination. In the further examination from Gothenburg, the translation that I've seen says that they can indicate that they occurred after death. So I am not convinced that there are bruises there that are of significance. I think the balance comes down on these being post-mortem phenomena, simply the result of the natural changes of the body after somebody dies. I would never say that I could exclude that Annie had been hit on the head and dumped in water. Pathologists are naturally cautious people. It would be foolish and irresponsible to say it can be excluded but that is only a conclusion that could be drawn when there is a totality of evidence to bring it up and a scenario is produced. It's worth reminding you that all Dr Hamilton has to go on is two autopsy reports and one grainy photo of Annie's face. We are without the kind of evidence that might offer an explanation as to the supposed deep bruising on Annie's body that led two different undertakers in two different countries to question the 30-year-old's death. Without access to all the pathological evidence, in particular the post-mortem photographs, Dr Hamilton can't make a true assessment. In the case for suicide, that leaves a big gap. There are some cases 
where it's like listening to the radio in a slightly dodgy uh, signal area. And instead of getting a clear signal, you've just got a little bit of hiss in the background. It's one or two things and things that don't add up, things that aren't quite just clear. And they will produce enough just to really muddy the signal. When we set out to produce this episode, we found ourselves weighing what we were being told against the reality of what was supposed to happen on that Saturday in 2005. This lady was in Prestwick primarily to catch a plane back to Sweden, but somewhere along the way ended up being discovered on a beach. Annie was supposed to get on a plane at Prestwick Airport and fly to meet her friend Maria in Sweden. Everything appeared on course for that to happen. Instead, something went wrong at the airport and she ended up hurrying into Presswick town without ever buying a ticket. Either she was running from something or some unknown trauma not even her family have any awareness of caused her to behave erratically. Whatever it was, after 4 p.m. that afternoon, Annie was never seen alive again. We've raised lots of questions in this episode and we're now almost at the end. Join us for our final episode where we will try and bring the story to a conclusion. We should say at this point, if you're one of Annie's friends from Edinburgh and you have information you believe to be important, then please email us, storycast at sky.uk.